Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Welcome. Why don't you guys rise and let's, uh, let's sing that together. When I look at your heavens, moon and stars set in motion, oh God, King all glory and honor, what is man that you are mindful, son of man that you would care?
good to be able to sing that, that the story of each one of us, if we were in Christ, we were lost, but now we were found, that you and your love and your mercy and your grace pursued us, we weren't pursuing you, we were alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, opposing you because we wanted to rule ourselves, Lord, thank you for opening our eyes to the foolishness of that to the emptiness of that and turning our eyes to our place-taking Savior. And in this moment, Lord, we want gratitude to spill out of us as we proclaim the truth of who he is as well as we just 
encourage one another to turn our eyes to him. Lord, we want to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the cross and the death there that should have been ours. Thank you that his death was sufficient to pay the penalty we owe for our sin so that we might be redeemed, that we might be yours, secure eternally and purposed today. So we look to him as our savior with gladness and gratitude. We look to you, Lord, as our sustainer because we come in from all kind of weeks and we're heading into all kind of weeks. So we thank you for your grace that saves and we thank you for your grace that sustains and instructs us. And so, Lord, Lord, in this hour, receive from us what is due you, but do in us a reassuring work, a reestablishing work, not in ourselves, but in the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is so that we might represent him well as we leave this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. Glad you're here to worship with us. Uh, my name is Buddy Lyles. I serve as one of the pastors here, and it's just my privilege to greet you on behalf of our entire church. If you are newer, um, you can use the QR code in the, uh, any of the seat backs in front of you, uh, and that lets you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little info, um, so that we could follow up with you just to let you know a little bit more about Allen Bible. You can also use the one here on the screen. And if you are newer to us, new-ish, um, we have our next discovery class in two Sundays. Discovery is uh, not obligating you to anything. You can come to it just to hear the vision, the values, the heart of Allen Bible, who we are and who we feel like the Lord is calling us to become. Um, and that'd be a great way for you to kind of get to know us a lot better, particularly when we want to get to know you. Our classes aren't huge, and so there's opportunity to get to know uh, you in that setting as well. And then for those who've been around here a little bit and you're like, hey, we do want to kind of lean into possibly calling this place home. This would be your first step. But again, it's not an obligation. Uh, we also encourage one another to give as part of our worship. Uh, if you receive our emails, you can see that we've had some lean summer months. So we're seeking the Lord, asking you pray with us uh, and as well as give with us as the Lord leads. And you can do that by using that code here. You can drop um, uh, your offering in the box or you can mail it uh, as well to the church office. Two quick things where that not only is an act of worship, but a way to invest in what God is doing in here, as well as beyond our walls. Um, coming up Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, is a back-to-school cookout. Uh, we're doing that here, uh, both to kick off our fall here, but it's particularly a way for you to invite neighbors. This is our way to support you of, hey, I've, been, I've got a friend, I've got a neighbor, I'd love something not too high bar to invite them to. It's a great way to, to, to invite them. So. I encourage you to do that, as well as um, we've been uh, making inroads. The Lord's been giving us some opportunities with three of our neighbors just to the north here, the apartments, 301. And so um, this past week, um, Mike and their management circulated like 200 flyers throughout the, uh, that complex. I don't think 200 people are coming. Well, that'd be awesome. Um, but we'd love to be at the ready to welcome anyone who comes, your neighbors and coworkers or there are 301 neighbors. And then lastly, there's too many things with the fall starting to say anymore other than uh, you can go to our events page. A lot of things are kicking off. Um, Women's Bible study midweek, that's in two weeks. So um, you can go there as well as sign up for our email online. Um, at this time, our kids are dismissed, uh, first through fourth grade to your class. And if you'd stand back up, we're going to sing uh, one more song before uh, the message this morning. Thank you. 
when we think about what you've done, we think about who you are, God. You, you freed us through the perfect example, which became the perfect sacrifice. And that was your son. It just doesn't make sense. And uh, I can't, it's not something I can wrap my head around, God. I just pray, God, that we would never get over that. Um, Father, we just, and we lift up this time to you, God. I just pray for Jim as he is about to come and, and share with us what you've laid on his heart. I pray that for clarity for him. And God, I just pray for open minds and open hearts to receive what, what you have for us this morning. Would you help us to be receptive? God, we pray it all for your glory and through your Son, Jesus. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. I'm Melody Adams. Um, my husband Rob and our daughters Karis and Lucy are in the Boivars Life Group. Um, today I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 23. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing and inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from the thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Melody. Just before I jump into my part, I want to pray for the Adams. They're part of our missionary family here. And their school year is ramping up as they work with Indian students, especially at the University of Texas here in Dallas. And great opportunities before them and some great challenges. So let's pray together, if we may. Father, how grateful we are for the Adams. Thank you that you brought them to us here. We pray that you would encourage them as they've moved into this new season of opportunity and meeting new students, of re-upping relationships with old ones. And we just pray that you would bless, encourage them as their girls start school, as they begin to meet others. May it be a fruitful year and one in which you are honored greatly. So encourage them, we pray, Lord, even as we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. My voice has transitioned. But for those of you I have not met, my name is Jim Allen, part of the fellowship here, and have the opportunity today of opening God's word uh, as we come almost to the end of our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, buddy, next week we'll wrap it all up and fix everything those of us that have preached this summer were wrong, but that's always good. We want that to happen and get it fixed. But as we come to the study today... I looked at that when he first asked me to take this passage, and I said, I know why you gave me this one. This is the hardest one in the whole sermon. But uh, 
Maybe that's because I have more gray hair than he does. But um, I couldn't help but think as we've been going through this study, which I've greatly appreciated and appreciated all of the different men that have shared with us. Some of you will remember when we were traveling in Israel together. Actually, a group of 52 of us went to Israel several years ago. And we were meeting on the mount that they believe that this sermon was preached. And I had asked a group of you to read one each of the Beatitudes. And I thought, boy, this will be great, sitting up here and hear the Lord say, blessed are thee. So we got up on the hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee and started to read. And this near hurricane came up. And I don't think we heard a word <laughs> that was read that day. But it was an interesting time and an interesting reminder as we think that here is Jesus talking to hundreds and being heard. Amazing situation that is there. But uh, one of the things that I appreciate has been rehearsed frequently during this time is the reminder that the Sermon on the Mount can't be lived. So I find myself saying, well, why is it here then? Well, it can't be lived because only Jesus can live it totally, perfectly, completely. But God obviously has some concerns about it being a standard to which those who want to follow him are committed to go. And the question has been dealt with on several different Sundays. Who was he speaking to? And probably that question becomes more critical today than it has at some of the other weeks that we've looked at it. And it starts out in chapter 5, where the whole sermon began, very simply saying, he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So there's no question he wanted his disciples to hear what he was saying. But the whole time he was speaking, there was a crowd there. And by the time you get to the end of the message that Buddy will cover for us next week, the Pharisees and some of the rest of the people that were there says, man, that guy can speak. He's got more power than anybody we've heard, any of our religious leaders. So the crowd was involved in this. So my picture of what is happening here is the disciples are immediately gathered around him and he's really talking directly to them. But everybody else is listening and he just happens to know that. And he wants them to pick up on some of this information. And that truth that he's speaking, especially to his disciples, becomes really critical. Because as we listen to what Melody read this morning, He's saying some things that, wait a minute, that, that's what we ought to go on the radio and preach to a lost world. But if he's focusing on his disciples, that has some interesting challenges for us. He clearly wanted those who said, and I like the term Dan Martin used, the all-inners, the ones that were really just plugged in to believing what he said they needed to hear, as well as those that were the cynics and the sitting on the outside. But this message has strong implications for those who claim to believe in Jesus Christ, as well as those on the outside. So we look at that slide right there. My first thought today is on the road to true righteousness, and this next slide gives us our first shot. How do we get there? So he says, let me give you some directions on how we get to this road of true righteousness because that's what he's been talking about throughout the sermon. We all have ideas about what's good, what's right, what we think people ought to do, and most of us have opinions on what other people ought to be doing. So Jesus comes back and he says, this is what true life is and true righteousness look like. And he uses the concept, two gates. You can flip that next slide. 
But you notice he says, enter by the narrow gate. And the next one, for the gate is wide and the way is broad. So we got two gates here, one that's narrow, one that's broad. And so considering the fact that we got these two entrances, some of your versions read two books, or two uh, doors, excuse me. The whole idea here, and I like what Dr. McGee said about it, he said, picture it like a funnel that's got the big end on the top. And so if you're pouring, as my wife frequently says to me, Jim, the salt shaker needs to be filled. I always grab a funnel, otherwise I'm spilling it all over the place. So that's the easy one to get in. That's, you can put it in any way you want to. You can dump it, you can toss it, you can pour it, you can jump, whatever it is. He says, so there's this broad way, but it leads to death. And sermons today are preached on how easy it is to get in, and it's not hard to get in, but there are some specifics of it. What makes the narrow way narrow? is it's not my decision of what to do or how to do it. Or it's not my decision on, well, I like it, I would rather do it this way. And so many times in today's preaching, it's do your good things outweigh your bad things? Are you really a good person? I've heard people say, well, I'm a Christian, I was born in America. I'm not real sure we'd say that anymore. <laughs> but. Uh, some of those challenges are coming up there, being good, working hard. And of course, here he's tapping on the Pharisees who believed in their good works being what was impressing God. And he says, hey, that road leads to destruction. It might be able to get in with your own direction, but it doesn't lead the right place. In the narrow way, there's only few but he put out in the uh, email announcement this week, how come there's only few? Well, I'm gonna let him answer that next week, except for the fact that there's only few because the way in is established by somebody else. It's not my decision in terms of what the way is, it's my decision whether I will respond to it. And that way is very simply as we read in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Or Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we don't like that. We like to be able to say, well, I did, I can. And so he starts out talking here about this is how you get to true life. It's not about you and what you think you ought to do. It's about God and what he has stated needs to happen and how it can take place. And the result of going in the narrow end is life. Because when you go in that end, what happens? It opens up. And the great opportunity for real life becomes possible. But there's a deterrence to that. In the next slide, there's some things that slow that down. Let's go to the next one. There were two gates. I'm sorry, I'm not pushing this ahead of time here. But there are some things that stand in the way of getting to true life and true righteousness. And we read those beginning in verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 11, is the reminder that false prophets were very common in the Old Testament times. So when Jesus was speaking at this point, everybody out there knew about false prophets. There were even the true prophets that the Jewish leaders said were false, and there were the false prophets that the Christian group indicated were false. But many false prophets will come and lead many. But beginning in verse 15, beware of those false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, it's something else. 
They're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered by thorn bushes, are they? Nor figs from thistles, are they? For every good tree bears good fruit, but the rotten tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So then you will know them, and some versions read you'll recognize them by their fruits. So how do I deal with that? These false prophets, and boy do they exist today. In fact, one of the greatest concerns that I am seeing today and hearing too often are preaching basically that are taking their messages out of social media and then defending that in scripture. I've heard some most incredible interpretations of scripture in recent days that defend the teachings of the day rather than the truth of God's word. And the real danger that is there, their focus is me, it's money, it's all kinds of things like that, and their message simply doesn't match up with God's message. I like Paul David Tripp, Trish and I are going through his book again that we went through as a church a number of years ago where he says, beware of the kingdom of self because it's a costume kingdom. It does a perversely brilliant job of masquerading as the kingdom of God. And that's where the false prophets come in. So it gives us two instructions. How, how do we deal with this issue that there are false prophets? That, that's not the question. They are there. Well, first of all, we need to be Bereans. How many of you know what a Berean is? Okay, I see, I need to fix that with several of us. Also on our trip to Israel, we were in Berea and we stood at the city square where they say Paul was when he made these statements about this whole idea. And the statement there in Acts 17, 11 is that Paul and Silas arrived in Berea and went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scripture to see whether these things were so. You see, a Berean is a person that when they hear something, goes to God's word with the question, is that true? Now, the end of today, I'd love it if you would go do that. Buddy would love it if you would go do that if it became the habit of all of us of checking God's word to see if what we are hearing matches what God has said. And that becomes a critical challenge to all of us. In fact, my statement is it's a compliment to your pastor if you check him up and ask, is what he's saying true? Because then he's accomplishing what he wanted you to be doing, getting into the word. Second thing we're supposed to do besides be Bereans is be fruit inspectors. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Avinash was here, and he spoke from chapter 7, verse 1, do not be a judge unless you be judged yourself. Well, a judge weighs motives, or a judge passes condemnation, and those are not our responsibility. So I don't sit in judgment of you. That's not my job. But I am instructed to check things out to see if they're true, for knowing what is going to influence me, and I am instructed to be a fruit inspector. Is there fruit, Christ following imitators, or is it something totally different? Is there fruit, follow me and head my way, or is there fruit, biblical obedience? Notice a couple of verses on the screen. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Or Ephesians chapter 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away with you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Or in 1 Timothy, 
but he dealt with this several weeks ago when we installed new elders. A church leader should be a above reproach. Husband to one wife is what says in most of our English versions, but it really is saying a one woman kind of man. I had the privilege of speaking at an installation of a pastor at a church in California a number of years ago. And he, never forget, he stood in the pulpit and he said, I will not touch your women. And then he was asked to leave the church for messing with the women. And the only thing it wasn't, it wasn't in the church, it was outside. Uh, tragic situation, but a one woman kind of man, not addicted to wine, free from the love of money, good manager of his own household, not conceited, with a good reputation with those outside the church. So the simple question is, to whom are you listening? There are podcasts out there today by the thousands. In fact, growing, and I, I, I have never heard one, but I know some people that listen to them faithfully. They, they are podcasts done by recovering evangelicals. Now just think that through the implications of that. Uh, and I've watched people that are listening to that really fading in their commitment to God that is demonstrated by fruit inspection. So we need to be fruit inspectors. Simple question is, to whom are you listening? Third, and this is where it begins to get really challenging, and that's disasters on the road to true life and righteousness. In these, in these scriptures, let me just read 21 to 23. Now, remember, who's, who's he talking to? Mainly the disciples. And it's for the benefit of the crowd, but he's mainly talking to those that have said, we're with you. Now, you remember who one of the guys was in that crowd of 12? A guy named Judas. Okay, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And you read that, and you think, oh, my goodness. I've, I've had some times in life that I've said, you know, is that me? When, when I know my behavior hasn't been what I wish it had been, uh, but he's talking to people who claim to be Christ followers. Now, this always gets a little muddy here, so I want to try to be careful. We believe firmly in the theological eternal security. Once saved, always saved. But the issue becomes, what is the once saved? Is simply praying a prayer, I'm now saved? And he's dealing that. I, I don't know why I remembered it, but as soon as I read this passage, I remembered an old song that I heard 212 years ago. They called them back then Negro spirituals. Everybody talking about a heaven ain't a going there. And you say, wait a minute. He's, he's talking to disciples. He's talking to people that claim to believe in him. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day. And he's saying, there's going to be some bad stuff happen here. And if you look at it from that sense, he could be talking to members of good churches, Sunday school teachers, traveling evangelists, preachers, members of the board. So you come back to, you know, as John 1.12 says, as many as received him, 
To them gave he the authority to be called the children of God, even to those that believe in his name. Received is the old, I, I like the illustration here, is and this happened again last night at our house. Doorbell rang and followed by a knock on the door, opened it up and there were two young men there that wanted to talk about God. They are serving God, and I don't sit in judgment of them at all. I, I admire their faithfulness. I admire their willingness to do that. But as I have talked to some of them, I question who they believe in, where, where they have really committed themselves to follow him. He says, if you've recognized who he is, and, and the whole idea is too many has received him, basically says when that knock on the door comes, you open and say, hey, I know who you are. Come right in. Or like we do with most people that knock on the door these days, yes. Uh, you know, what are you selling? <laughs> what, what, what do you want to give me? Whatever, however it deals with that. And so I keep coming back to this phrase. This, this helps me as I look at this whole subject is I need to remember that the Bible never says make Christians. What does it say? Make disciples. Make those people who are committed to follow Jesus to see that their life is guided by his life, guided by his principles, guided by those things that he teaches and is taught in his word. And that becomes the key challenge that we all face. And so he called his disciples, and that word can simply mean followers. So the question is, okay, you can be a follower, but what are you following? Getting back up to the truth getting back up to what the word of God has to say. And so that challenge is ours, those who follow him. But I want to do something a little bit different. I would say in closing, but you never listen to a guy on a pulpit say in closing. But uh, our, our next one I simply call demonstrations of true life and righteousness. What will it look like if I have found true life and seek to demonstrate righteousness? And we always need to keep in mind salvation is a free gift from God. He paid the price. We don't have to do anything. But true salvation has marks, has demonstrations, has characteristics. You know, I can tell you that I am a great baseball player. I might even buy and wear a uniform, like a lot of people are doing this day, that say, Texas, X World Series champions. <laughs> but that doesn't make them baseball players. But when they get out on a field and show you what they can do with a bat and a ball and a glove, you begin to say, yeah, this guy is a ball player. And I think the Christian life we need to keep in mind fits into that category. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Whole different approach for just a minute. Because when I first read this passage in Matthew, I thought, you know, this is going to be really easy to preach. All you say is watch out for the bad guys. And then all of a sudden, start, wait, wait a minute. Yes, it's important to, to point out errors. You know, I've taught chaos of the cults more times than one, uh, where people have claim to be followers of God and head off in their own direction. And, and it's important to help people see that. It's one of the reasons why somebody's standing on this platform every Sunday saying, thus says the Lord, because it gives us that standard we can be watching. 
But my greater concern, as we look at this together in this context, is the number of people, and I, and I have to be very careful at this point because I cannot, do not want to sit in judgment because only God knows the heart. But the number of people that I have known over my lifetime, that looking around here is probably longer than any of yours, that have claimed to have received Christ and have no demonstration of it in their lives. Righteous deeds do not save. but they are an evidence of genuine salvation. So Peter gives us a great reminder here, and I want to just look at it as quickly as somebody up front can do. His invitation is, take a look in the mirror. You know, forget the person next to you, but just look in the mirror for a moment. First in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. True salvation is a gift from God. I can't earn it. I can't go buy it somewhere. I can't do enough to get it. It is a gift from God. But it also reminds us that this passage is written to believers. It's written to people who have made a statement of faith in Jesus Christ. And as you read through it, it indicates they most likely are genuine believers in Jesus Christ. So it's written to challenge and encourage them. Secondly, in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. True righteousness is only possible, and I would add, but it is possible through Jesus Christ. He says, I have given you everything you need for life and godliness. And we could put that for life and true righteousness. Now, will we ever even just fulfill correctly the whole Sermon on the Mount? No. Will I ever do perfectly everything I've even heard from this platform? No. But God says, I have equipped you for everything necessary for life and godliness. But it's only possible as I am in Christ Jesus and walking in fellowship with him. And so those become key issues to this whole situation. Am I walking with him? Am I in the word enough to know what is true that I'm hearing? Am I seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then he puts this question in verse 10. And I'm going to throw you off with one word in there that uh, so many people, and that's choosing or election. But verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing for you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And we'll look at these things in just a moment. But he says, we need to look in this mirror and weigh the validity of what we claim to be true about our lives and our relationship with God. And I find myself asking the question, how often do I really do that? Do I really sit down and say, okay, Jim, let's rehearse how I am doing in my walk with God, in my claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm in church regularly. Yes, I help lead a life group. Yes, we do these things. But how am I doing? How am I demonstrating that I'm growing in him 
growing to be more like him. And here's another phrase that I really appreciate. The issue regarding salvation is not one of public reputation, but rather one of personal relationship. You see, I've been married for 61 years. And so the question is, not am I married, but how well am I married? How faithful I, am I to my wife? How faithful am I in loving her the way Christ loved the church? And in that sense, you hope that somebody could watch us and say, yeah, they know the Lord. Yeah, they seek to follow him. But so many of us just exist, just keep on going. So in verses, well, let's take a look at five to eight. He says, for this reason, the reason being you've been made a partaker of the divine nature. You've escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. In other words, God has cleansed you. He's equipped you. He's saved you from sin. He's given you the authority to move beyond sin, not perfectly by any means, but to be forgiven. And he says, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith. In other words, let's go to work, commit ourselves to demonstrate these characteristics. And so as I look in the mirror, I have to say, okay, Jim, is that you? I remember years ago when I was being ordained, one of the men at my ordination time said, would you read 1 Timothy chapter 3? So I read it out loud, and he said, is that you? Instantly, that's qualifications for leader in a church. I read a few of them a little while ago. I said, well, that's my desire. He said, I didn't ask if it was your desire. I don't know if it's you. Well... I hope so. I don't care if you hope so. Is it you? And I said, yes. And he said, I move we proceed. <laughs> but I'll never forget that setting right there. So he says here, for this very reason, apply all diligence in your faith. Supply. In other words, this is directed to me. So as I look in the mirror, am I working at, the first thing he says here is moral excellence which just boiled down is simply kindness and virtuous living pure living and I can influence those things I can do those things I, I struggle at times with it but I can do that because he's equipped me to do it so and it's interesting he says start there in this test in this check and then he says after that, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. You know, there's this five-letter word that there's a whole percentage of our population today wishes it wasn't there. It's called those that had to go to school. It's called study. He says, in your moral excellence, add knowledge. Knowledge of God's word. And how to apply it. Are you in his word? Are you studying it to learn how it works? How it fits? That's a clear demonstration of my desire to demonstrate that I'm a true follower of Jesus Christ. But you don't know how busy I am. Yeah, I realize some of us that are retired don't know how busy you are, but the whole issue is, am I seeking to know his word and how to apply it? And then he adds his next one, to your knowledge, self-control. And that's not just temper. It might be how you spend your money. 
It might be what kind of decisions you make or what you make priorities in your life. Fourth is perseverance. Steadfast under adversity, it's been defined as. How, how do you handle the challenges? Just looking out over here, I know some of you have been through some serious challenges in recent days, some of it health-wise, some of it jobs-wise. How do you deal with that? And then he moves on. And in your perseverance, godliness, reverence toward God. Where does God fit in your thinking, in your conversation? And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. I like what one guy called that, fervent, practical, caring for others. And then he gets really naughty, and he says, and in your brotherly kindness, Christian love. Just really the giving of yourself to other people for their benefit. And these need to be increasing. So what's the mirror tell me as I look at that list? You see, it takes me back to the Sermon on the Mount where it's easy to talk about things, it's easy to claim things, but to demonstrate in my life, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I am doing those things that demonstrate that is true. One of the great challenges we face And then I love the next thought. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. And I love the concept is when you get to heaven, there'll be a ticker tape parade. God will be saying, there he comes. Everybody cheer. Roll out the ticker tape. It won't be, gee, I'm really sorry, but I don't know you. And what a tragedy that will be. So let me ask you three questions definitely as I close. Number one, which end of the funnel have you entered in your effort to please God? Are you setting the standards or are you turning it over to him? Secondly, to whom are you looking for biblical truth? And maybe I ought to add to that, and are you looking? Are you in the word enough to know truth from error? And thirdly, not perfectly, but does your life reflect the God-directed character of true righteousness? Now, I want to, you know, always got to have a caveat, but I want to be sure I'm not questioning anybody's salvation. I'm simply wanting from our text today to say, I can be confident of a right relationship with God. I can know my sins are forgiven. I can know I'm on my way to heaven. I can know that my salvation is secure. I don't have to worry about that. But the thing that will allow me to continue with confidence is to continue to grow. Daily seeking to grow with him. And as a preacher that I knew in Florida one time, We'll think about that. Let's pray as the music team comes up. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can know that we have a right relationship with you. And I pray for anyone that is 
concerned about that, even here today, that they'd seek out one of us, give us the opportunity of talking with them. But Lord, above all else, I pray that you would help each one of us to be seeking every day to be growing in that grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so we reflect it in our lives. And we'll just give you the praise as we thank you for it. and Thank you for the privilege that you've extended for people to be your children as we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you guys rise. Let's, uh, let's close the song together.
great week of worship. Thank y'all.